you know, you put TV on, you see the football match, and City fans are singing a song that I wrote 30 years ago, and before that, United fans sung it for a decade. Suddenly, this punk thing meant that, you know, my generation had its own rock and roll music. I went through a phase in the um, mid 1990s where I was on my ass, I was signing on, and Spirals had split up. We had no record deal at that point. And I had a joke, I had a standing joke with my, my, my wife at the time. Every time the phone went, I'd be like, oh, that'd be Richard Branson. You know what I mean? I was signing on, I was on my ass, you know what I mean? My name's Rory Cowan. I'm a student journalist and popular music fan. In this interview, I'll be talking to Clint Boone, one of the men who brought garage music to the masses. I'll be finding out his inspirations, ambitions, and what his legacy will be. Was songwriting a thing that came naturally to you? I'd say so, yeah. I think because by the time I started writing songs, I was a punk knocker. When I started writing my first songs, um, and I'd be 16, 17, and at that point, I'd obsessed about pop music for a good, well, since I was probably eight, nine, maybe earlier, where you, re, you, know, you, you learn every word to every song that's in the charts and all that. I grew up in that generation of um, Disco 45. It was a weekly paper comic you could get that had all the words to the chart records and that, and then little interviews with some of the bands. So it was important to me to learn words to songs, like when David Bowie was releasing singles through the early 70s. You know, you'd get home and you'd, you'd learn every word to it. And I can still, I still know most of the words to most of the boys' singles for that era. So by the time I started writing songs, I think I had a bit of an idea of what made a good song, you know what I'm saying? Um, having said that, some of the early stuff I wrote is a bit embarrassing when I listen to it now, but I'm still proud of it, still treasure it. You know, I listen to those first punk tunes. But then, um, yeah, by the time I got in my first proper band, which was the, well, I had a band called The Mill, with Manny out of the Roses, this is like 1984, 85, and a guy called Chris Goodwin. So I started writing a different way then. It was very psychedelic and quite colourful, a bit, a bit proggy, I suppose, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and then that led nicely into the Inspirals. So I joined the Inspirals in 1980, early 86, I joined the band. And I spent most of 1985 recording demos by the Inspirals. And then I joined them. And started writing early on, so I had a great vehicle then for my songwriting ideas. And speaking of inspirations, who were your inspirations when you were growing up? To be musically. Musically, yeah. The big one was Elvis, really. Elvis Presley was the first one that really, you know, hit me in a powerful way. But around that, everything else, you know, the Beatles, um, my mum and dad had this really diverse collection. Probably only about 30 albums, but really diverse. Um, and this was in like the 60s, early 70s, where if you wanted to listen to music, you'd either put Radio 1 on, or you'd play your mum and dad's records. And with it being such a limited collection, you'd play the same records over and over again. And in there, there's like a Tom Jones record, Shirley Bassey, a couple of Beatles albums, no Rolling Stones, so I can remember. There was Tamla Motown in there. There was musical soundtracks, Porgy and Bess, Carmen. So it's quite a, a, a broad spectrum of music for a kid like me in my formative years to be listening to every week. Um, so yeah, to go back to my biggest influences were Elvis and then the other 50s rock and rollers, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee, Bill Ailey and the Comets. I was obsessed about 50s rock and roll music right through into the early 1970s. So, you joined the Inspiral Carpets in 1986. What was your ambition in terms of success? I think at that point, I was hoping that one day I could be a professional musician. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think we all had that, every musician has that thing about I want to make a record and that can be a single Back then it could be a flexi disc, which it was for us. Our first, our first record was a flexi disc, yeah. and then we made our first single, which was a 12-inch and a 7-inch of the same tunes, and then we managed to do our first album. But I think for me, the, the, the main thing was always going to be, I want to be a professional musician. I want to do music for money. You know, that's what I want. I, I don't want to do a job. Um, when punk happened, I was at art college in Rochdale, and you know the idea was I was I was going to do me my course at Rochdale, then move on to university to do a Bachelor of Arts degree, or whatever they used to call it. But when punk happened, it was like, right, I know what I'm going to do now. I'm not going to be an art teacher, I'm not going to be a, um, you know, a painter or a sculptor, I'm going to be a musician. I could see that kids like me from Oldham, working class towns, 
with not much musical skill was suddenly on stage and on TV and on top of the pops. So that made me think, that's what I'm going to do. And lastly, what will your legacy be? In, in 100 years, what will, what will people say about Clint Boone? Who? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, it's hard saying it, it's like, I can't predict it. And I, li I like to think that people remember me. I think, I always remember, but when I was like, in the 80s, and I used to love obscure 60s psychedelic music, and I'd occasionally come across an album by a band that I'd never heard of. There was one called Synanthesia, and I got this album and obsessed about it. Didn't, when you, we didn't have the internet, so I couldn't go and find out if they're still alive. And I remember just like looking at these names on this cover and thinking, God, I, I wonder where he is now. I'd love to know about that man who played the keyboards on that song, or this guy that managed when we wrote the sleeve notes. Look at that, what he created. And so maybe I'll just be that. Maybe I'll just be some small print on a record that people are like, Clint Boone, that's a funny name, isn't it? But he could play organ, couldn't he? You know, I don't know. I don't know. But I'm, ho I'm hoping I can contribute a bit more than that. And hopefully, my kids. We've got like five kids. I'm hoping that part of my legacy will be that they'll carry on um, reflecting the better aspects of my character and skills. Hopefully, I don't know. I, mean, I think it'd be nice to be remembered, wouldn't it? I find it easy to look at people like Morrissey and, and know how he'll be. Even a thousand years from now, people will know, know him for his work. They won't necessarily remember that it was a bit, of a, a bit of an oddball, you know what I mean? But for his work, genius. Guy Garvey, again, I think people still talk about his work a thousand years from now. I think a thousand years from now I'll probably be forgotten, but I think hundred I might be with a chance of just getting a also ran. <laughs>